Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking time out and joining us today. My name is Keith Downey. I'm with Harvard Advisors. Uh, we are a financial planning and wealth management firm. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is going to be around life insurance reviews. Uh, this first slide we're showing is a, little, is a little blurb about us and what we do. Um, wealth management and financial planning is, is more than just investment management and retirement projections. Uh, you know, a big part of that is protecting and maximizing a, a client's wealth, uh, sometimes even for the next generation. And life insurance, long-term care can be a big part of that, so that's why we, uh, we picked this uh, subject for today. Uh, today we're going to have, we have with us Jeff Craig with Mercury Financial. Uh, Mercury is one of our strategic partners. One of the benefits of Harvard Advisors being a truly independent firm is that we're not uh, captive to one product or carrier. So what Mercury provides us is industry expertise, uh, access to a lot of carriers, um, most of them big, big names that you would recognize if we went through them right now. And they give us leverage with those carriers so that we can um, get the best possible solution for our clients, whatever that solution may be that we're trying to achieve. So what Jeff is going to talk about today is uh, he's going to touch briefly on the evolution of life insurance because it's changed a lot in the last uh, know, 40 or 50 years for sure. A little bit about the importance of reviewing old policies. A lot of times we see in, in the business that uh, a policy gets put in place and then uh, never reviewed or touched again. It's very important to go back to those, and he's going to explain why that is. Uh, the benefits of combining life insurance and long-term care. Long-term care is a relatively new uh, form of insurance, and it's uh, evolved quite a bit and changed just in the few years it's been around. And uh, it's a very effective tool for preserving uh, a client's um, estate and wealth uh, in the case of, uh, of needing that care. And being able to combine it with a life insurance policy can be very attractive. And he's also going to go through a couple of case studies uh, without trying to get too complex, but um, those are going to be based around leveraging an old policy and how you can um, use cash value that's built up in one to maybe utilize and get a, um, a newer solution with uh, with more leverage and, and power than what the old solution had. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Jeff. He's going to go through the slides, and then I'll wrap it up at the end. So thanks again for joining us, and, and Jeff, you can take it away. Thank you, Keith, and I'd like to welcome everyone to what I hope will be a, a good experience as it relates to everyone's favorite topic, life insurance. And as we consider um, the information that we're going to review today, we will open up the line at the end of the meeting for anyone who has questions or concerns. And if, if, um, if there's a specific situation, we'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. So as as Keith mentioned, life insurance was first created back in the 18th century, um, and from then until today, it still is under the concept of insurance, which is, in, which is a spread risk amongst many individuals, um, and it was known as an amicable contribution back then to provide for the wives and children of deceased insureds. The first group consider, consisted of 2,000 initial members. And since then, it still remains as the most misunderstood financial product in the industry. So hopefully we can, can take away some of the mystery of that today. But I thought it would be uh, helpful to look at it from a historical perspective with products and names and terms that you probably run across as you've uh, considered, engaged, or purchased life insurance in the past. And the most well-known product is whole life. Um, it's popular in the 40s and 70s and even through today. The... Um, premium associated with the base life insurance benefit is contractually due every year. And as you see what financial markets have done over time, whole life products do produce a participating dividend, and that dividend often offsets those contractually required premiums in the form of a vanish or a helpful vanish. Um, and the dividend, as declared by the insurance company, is reestablished typically on an annual basis. Um, whole life products carry an underlying guarantee, also contractually based, that if the premiums are paid each and every year, that the, get, that the death benefit is guaranteed through age 100. 
Now, what that provides us with that contractual language is a fairly rigid premium structure. We find these products typically issued and marketed through a career distribution system. And when we dig into the whole life cash values, we oftentimes find that, um, that they're not very flexible in accessing cash and continuing to provide the death benefit that we're looking for. And we'll touch on that a little bit more. The um, next product that we'll talk about is known as Universal Life. And that was born in the 70s when interest rates exceeded 15 or 18 percent. And the actuaries got together and thought, is there a way to provide a more flexible type of product that can benefit from these high interest rates? And that's where Universal Life came from. Um, and it's marketed as flexible in regards to the premiums, frequency of premiums and amount of premiums, the access to the cash value, uh, and the interest rates that are credited into a Universal Life product are commensurate with the parent company's general account. So they invest their money in real estate and bonds, and some of that return is provided to the policyholder in the form of cash value and cash value increased. When you gain more flexibility, you typically give up um, give up a bit of uh, flexibility uh, when you you give up a bit of the guarantee involved in that. So that's when interest rates were um, exceeding uh, 15%. And then we move into the 80s, where variable universal life was introduced. And again, the actuaries and some clever sales folks in the industry got together and said, if we can invest the underlying cash value in equity-based accounts, what would that product look like? And what came out of that was the variable universal life, where you have typically 60 to 70 equity-based sub-accounts that the policy owner can choose from, allocate, and move between. And the interesting thing about variable life is that, or life insurance is in general, is that the gains are tax deferred. Therefore, you can reallocate without incurring any short or long-term uh, capital gains and income tax treatment. Um, life insurance is illustrated on the variable side with a linear return and the options include between 6 and 12%. If there's one thing we've learned from the markets out there, that there's no linear return in the stock market, it's um, very much of a up and down, gain and loss environment that that works with. One thing different about variable life than universal or whole life is that the actual equity-based sub-accounts are held outside of the general company's um, assets, which provides an additional level of security in the event of claims and creditors. So variable life, when managed correctly, there's a fabulous opportunity to participate in the gains, and a well-managed account can harvest some of those gains without incurring taxes. Um, unfortunately, the life insurance industry is not long on service, and many of these policies ended up being forgotten assets in down markets and they do participate directly with the performance of the sub-accounts, both up and down. And if we were to use a financial um, analysis on that, if in some of the years that we've had uh, bear markets, a 25% reduction in account value would require the following years a 50% increase just to break even. So there is some, some great benefits to this, but there are also um, – there's also some risk involved, so um, certainly a good advisor can assist you in, in working through that. The next product that we're going to discuss today is a fairly new product, and this was a result of all the studies done on the variable life where the downside was the biggest detriment to the long-term performance of that policy. So they came up with a product called Indexed Universal Life, where the desire was to participate in the upside, but also provide a floor um, of typically zero on the downside. And it invests directly in indices. Typically, they're purchased on the 15th of each month, directly proportional to an insurance company's total block of business. And they purchase the indices that mirror the S&P, the Hang Seng, and the Euro stock indices. What they're hoping for out of this product is a mid-range performance 
And I've also got a note there that it's managed partially as um, with a floor, you don't have the, the risk of a significant downside. The last product we're going to talk about today is really the most common. It's the most owned and utilized during an individual's working years, and it's known as Group Life. Group Life is a product that's provided typically by an employer, and the majority of the time, a base amount, say 50000 or one-time salary, is provided by the employer with the ability to increase your coverage um, at an annual opt-in period. The um, group life, in my humble opinion, has a number of oversights by those who utilize it as their primary source of life insurance. And the ability to convert it, should you choose to leave that employer, um, the ability to maintain your insurability is not available with group life. And it typically expires at termination or retirement. And some of the older plans wind down after a period of five years from normal retirement age 65 to a maximum of age 70. Um, and what we see in utilizing that group life as the primary life insurance product in a family's portfolio is that less than 2% of all term policies actually pay a death benefit. So when we make recommendation after doing a thorough review of an individual's situation, we often think that you, it's better to take what is provided by the employer as the base benefit and then to supplement with a personally owned term policy for which you do have convertibility. Um, you're able to take it with you, and you've also preserved your insurability should health change in the future. Internal Revenue Code 7702 talks in terms of the laws governing life insurance. And this is where the biggest benefit of understanding what this can do for you as it pertains to the, the safety, security, and uh, financial access uh, to you, your family, or your business situation. So Internal Revenue Code 7702 provides that death benefits are provided to the beneficiary income tax-free that any cash value accumulation accumulates on a tax-deferred basis. If, an, if the owner of the policy chooses to cash in the policy and there is a gain, which would be net cash value greater than contributed premiums, then any gain in the policy would be at ordinary income tax rates. The cash values and the access to cash values are on what we call a FIFO basis, First, in, first out, and the return of basis in, typically initially is in the form of a withdrawal, and then the remainder of the gain can be borrowed from the contract. A loan against the contract is ultimately paid off by the death benefit, which is on a tax-free basis, which is why you may hear um, in some presentations that you can get to tax-free income, and it's a very beneficial um, opportunity when you're looking at um, accessing and utilizing the cash value portion of the policy as opposed to the death benefit. So now that the, the history and tax laws are over, let's take a look at the importance of managing your policy and a periodic review. We talked in terms of market of universal life that was developed in um, the the 70s when interest rates were doing very well and that variable life was developed in the 80s when the stock market was doing very well. And what we find in, in retrospect is that life insurance companies are reactionary as opposed to visionary. So when those products were produced, they were done at a, at a majority of the cycle having been completed. Well, what do we know today? We know that interest rates aren't at 18 percent. They're crediting at 4 to 5 percent. So when clients bought Universal Life back in the 70s and they were shown an illustration that assumed maybe 10 payments would cover the cost of the insurance through life expectancy and typically to age 100, 
that certainly it could do it at 18%, but they're not able to do it at today's rates of 4 or 5%. So when we, tip, when we review a client's policy, we stress test it to see how it's performed, what it looks like today from the form of a snapshot in an enforced illustration, and then we also ask for several different renditions of the review of the existing policy to see, one, how long it will last with no additional premiums, and, how much, and two, how much, how much in the form of additional premiums do we need to contribute to this so that it does last through life expectancy. Similarly, in the 1980s, the stock markets produced exceptional returns. Um, the illustrations that are provided, again, are on a linear 6, 7, 8 percent projection. But what we've seen is there's been tremendous um, loss of account value when you hit a down market like we did in in 2000, 2001, 2002, and 2008, and looking at just the S&P. So again, um, if you're a client that is holding a variable life insurance contract, it's critical to be very conservative in your approach of what's projected to produce the desired output. And again, that's a benefit of looking at it um, periodically. We recommend that we look at, at the products, um, the existing products every two to three years. And the majority of the time, we're able to give a, a check plus to the performance of the policy, but there are times that um, opportunity and change provides for um, a slightly different type of product or uh, maybe a reduction in the death benefit as an option to reduce costs as they change. Um, a client's biggest uh, maybe oversight is that they take what they saw in the original illustration and then believe that that's, that's represented in the contract. And that's just not the case. So um, again, critical to review this every few years based on market conditions. What are some industry factors um, that have occurred over the last 20 or 30 years that may dictate the need for change or certainly the need for review? Insurance companies use US Census that's taken every 10 or 20 years, um, depending when it was done. And insurance rates are trending down because people are living long so to produce the same death benefit amount, it costs less today than it did a few years ago. Um, every year, the insurance industry develops new products and riders, and they too can provide some, some decent benefit. Um, another reason to consider is if you have a policy with a carrier that's experienced some financial challenges and difficulty, downgrades occur, that's able to be uh, determined by the, um, the various rating agencies that update, upgrade, and downgrade carriers on a monthly basis. So there's an a, a established guideline for strength and claims paying ability for the life insurance industry. Um, many carriers have exited the business when it comes to standalone long-term care and also disability. And the, the reason for that is that a long-term care and a disability claim has, doesn't have a defined end period. So the carriers that issued policies in the past with these two types of products have experienced tremendous claims um, that oftentimes go many more years than they originally anticipated. There are also some economic factors that provide a client um, maybe some incentive to stay on claim, and that would be um, you know, a downgrade in their industry, the medical profession now, many of the physicians, um, if they end up getting on a disability claim, it sometimes becomes more attractive um, than going back to work for less money. So those are the industry factors that may cause a change. Personal factors that may affect the uh, viability of your life insurance policy. As in every other asset, the owner of the insurance policy has the control. They have the ability to change, alter, change the beneficiary, add premium, access the cash values, reduce the death benefit. Um, so the owner ultimately controls any of the changes that, that may occur. Proper beneficiary designation, if a beneficiary was listed as um, one, one beneficiary in the beginning of the policy, 
the policy review should include whether or not that beneficiary is still in good standing with the owner if it's the desired result. Um, evolving objectives occur when you take out a policy, maybe in your working years, in your 40s and 50s, and now you end up getting into your 60s and 70s. Um, does that policy still provide the same benefit and should, should change be considered? Um, divorce is an interesting um, factor when it comes to life insurance as the, um, the beneficiary designation on a life insurance policy will supersede the, the divorce decree. So while I'm sure there's been some, um, some friendly divorces out there, typically um, if you've left your life insurance beneficiary to your ex-spouse, they have a very good chance of claiming that death benefit if it has not been changed or updated. And then lastly, on the personal factors, children, um, if they're minors or of age, you want to make sure that the proper beneficiary designation provides for the distribution of death benefit proceeds in the event of uh, a child becoming of age. Um, the political factors that we keep in mind typically refer to tax law changes, and certainly with what occurred at the end of 2012 and 2013, where the lifetime exemption that was once thought to be um, to be extinct at the end of 2012 was extended uh, permanently at five million dollars per client. It's also indexed for inflation and currently is at 5.24 million per person that they're able to remove from their estate during a lifetime basis and also that provides them some generation skipping. So policies that were bought assuming a lower death exemption may be more than the client actually needs. So we also have some strategies to reduce that, reduce the outlay, or do some additional charitable bequests with um, policies that have been affected by a political or tax law change. Producers. Um, life insurance is thought to be a sold product as opposed to a purchased product. And we'd like to say that everyone's had a good buying experience, but we know that's just not the case. Producers are in a competitive situation where they think that they should present the lowest possible cost to the individual to purchase a life policy. But what we find with that is the lowest price shifts a tremendous amount of the risk to the insured for the lowest price isn't always the best long-term um, financial situation. So when we provide a consultative approach, we hope that a proper presentation includes very much of a consultative, multi-carrier approach to this thing in the purchase of life insurance to include the financials and ratings of the various insurance companies, different types of products, as one does not satisfy all needs, assumptions that are used. We typically take a very conservative look at that. There are different riders that a uh, prospective life insurance policy may provide. Um, then it's always good to look at two or three different premium schedules, um, which will blend in with lifestyle. We see a lot of products that are sold with a lifetime premium schedule. And if the product is dependent upon the premium each year, what we find is that when folks get into their 70s and 80s and ailments such as Alzheimer's and other debilitative um, medical situations occur, that they've got to be sure that that policy is going to be able to be stress tested uh, if they don't happen to have all their, all their wits about them. So it's, it's important to look at different premium schedules. And then also we want to make sure that flexibility is an option in each of the uh, each of the presentations that we uh, show. Let's now take a look at a couple of case studies. As Keith mentioned earlier, relative to what you might do um, if you've got an existing policy and what options are available. And as Keith also mentioned, long-term care is a tremendous benefit when it's properly and the life insurance industry has taken two different approaches with this. One is the standalone life long-term care policy, 
and the long-term care policy um, that's not priced properly, we're seeing significant increases in premium each year, and a lot of those costs are, are skyrocketing. Additionally, standalone long-term care is a use it or lose it uh, type of product for if you don't have a long-term care illness, the premiums, the cumulative premiums that have been paid into it um, would be um, not eventful from a financial viewpoint. So what the life industry did was it decided to take a life policy and put a long-term care rider attached to it, which provides the client the opportunity to access the death benefit for long-term care costs by accelerating the death benefit during the lifetime. And the example we're going to look at takes a look at an, a current policy that transferred the existing cash value to a new policy. Um, the client needs to go through current medical underwriting. And the most common type of rider is a 2% rider. So if you had a $500,000 policy, 2% of that is $10,000 that the client would have access to $10,000 of the $500,000 life policy per month to be allocated to um, their long-term care illnesses. Um, when you reduce, when you use that for long-term care, it does reduce the death benefit proportionately. And as we'll see on this next slide, it provides a great benefit to uh, preserve the retirement plan assets by incorporating this type of structure into your overall financial plan. Um, what this bullseye represents is in the center is the retirement uh, investment assets used for lifestyle. And if they were, if they were um, going to purchase a, long, a life policy with a long-term care rider on it, on the upper left-hand side, you'll see that in the event of a premature death, the death benefit would be paid to the beneficiary. And then in the lower left-hand side, you see the long-term care claim that you would reduce the death benefit by the cost associated with uh, long-term care, um, nursing home, and it also provides for a home health care benefit. So we call this the shield of armor to protect those retirement benefits. And when we do our analysis and presentation, we also want to make sure that we've got a cost structure that is managed, affordable, and defined as opposed to the, um, the, the long-term care illness, which averages per claim is about $175,000 and three and a half years of nursing home or home health care. But if we end up with um, a Lou Gehrig's or an Alzheimer's or one of those more mental debilitative issues, that can extend the claim well into the um, seven digits. So when we talk in terms of utilizing a life policy with a long-term care rider to protect or shield your retirement assets, that's so we can have a, a defined cost and also benefit from that. I don't know if this slide, um, for those of you with the poor vision like mine, it's a little bit difficult to read, but what we have here is a, um, a female 68 years old who had an existing life insurance policy with $100,000 of cash value in it. And she also had a desire to contribute to this policy for 10 years at $15,000. So at 68 years old, the cumulative premium over 10 years was was $250,000. And over on the right-hand side, you'll see really the, the benefit that, that this provides. On the right-hand column, you'll see benefit for long-term care of $557,000 in total, available all years. And you've also got the death benefit at $557,000. So how this would work is if the client died, they would get the death benefit. If they had a long-term care illness, they could access 2% of $557,000 per month for as long as the illness um, persisted and also as long as the death benefit um, could sustain. So you've got about 55 months. You've got 50 months at $11,000 per month of long-term care benefit here in the event of that long-term care illness um, coming about. So the, we talked a little bit about a standalone long-term care product, which is a use it or lose it based on the cumulative premiums you've paid. 
the three options that you have with a life policy with a long-term care benefit to it is one, you always have access to cash in that policy and use it as, as the owner sees fit. The second is um, as long as the, the trigger for the long-term care illness is to satisfy two of six um, daily living um, to access the rider benefits and the ADLs are transfer, eating, feeding, bathing, dressing, and bowel management. So that really covers off um, a wide variety and it's not overly difficult to, uh, to qualify for this in the event of someone getting on in years, having some ambulatory or some um, medical issues. And then lastly, if you don't use the benefit that's been provided in this example, it always, uh, it'll always pay off a benefit in the form of a, of a death benefit. So those are really the three biggest benefits that we see for clients who have existing life policies and they've accumulated cash over time. It's typically um, a fairly easy transition to look at what's available in the marketplace consider the different carriers and types of products that have the long-term care rider with them, and then to add that long-term care rider as a tremendous benefit to an existing life insurance policy. Case study number two takes a look at a slightly different situation. In this particular case, um, we've got an executive who bought a $1.6 million policy back in November of 1993 and they were paying about $4,500 per year into that. The current cash value uh, that's in there today is about $630,000. There's no surrender charge associated with this particular policy. And we see down at the bottom that the cost basis is $343,000. So back in 1993, this gentleman was 41 years old. Today, he's closer to, uh, I think he's 60, 61 years old, and he no longer needs the death benefit per se specifically to replace income, but now he's got he's accumulated a significant amount of cash value, and when we present it to him that he's got the opportunity to take some of that cash value in the form of the cost basis and create a legacy for his heirs, he became very interested and asked us to proceed forward with him. What we see on this next page, um, and this pertains to that Internal Revenue Code 7702, which is you can get back your basis or cumulative premiums out of your policy with no taxable consequences. So we see the cumulative premiums paid of $343,000. And what we ended up doing is structuring a policy on he and his wife. And we took that 343000 we put it into a survivorship or second-to-die policy. And just the basis of this policy at their ages, 60 and 61, provided us over three columns from the right, a policy of $2.775 million in second-to-die, owned in an irrevocable life insurance trust that lasts through age 100. So we took the basis from the 631. And what we did with the remaining value and ongoing premium commitment was replace almost all of the $1.65 million in a single life policy on his life only. And so the reason this is available today is that his policy performed well. He committed premiums to it over time and that with the efficiencies that are afforded the newer life insurance policies, because people are living longer and the premiums are less expensive, here we were able to provide a single life policy to replace what he has at almost the same amount, and we were also to add about $2.7 million into a trust for the benefit of his kids and grandkids, and the net benefit on that was $2.67 million with no additional out-of-pocket expense. So I think we'd all agree that that's a, a very significant um, leverage play that exists in many of the policies that are out there today to um, utilize current underwriting, current policy provisions, less expensive mortality cost, and to, um, to provide this review is, is something that both Keith and I can assist you with um, at any point. Now, when you're considering what to do with your life insurance policies, one thing that we offer um, 
through our retained attorneys here at Mercury to the folks at, at Harvard Advisors is also to take a look at your wills and trusts at the same time. Our retained attorneys will take a look at the legal documents as they pertain to basic wills, trusts, by sell agreements, and irrevocable trusts, and come back with a one or two page, very simple and plain English summary of what the legal documents say. And when we review them for effectiveness going forward, we find that many of them don't have power of attorney and don't have um, medical directives. So those are two very, very important things that we want to make sure that individuals have in place so that when the time comes um, of need, of death, or of medical incapacity, that, that the, um, the legal documents are up to date and will dictate um, exactly what the client wants to do relative to um, disposition of their assets and also their desires relative to the medical directive. So we encourage you to take advantage of both the policy review and the document review, which are available through our friends at Harvard Advisors. And no, no um, presentation is complete without a next step and an action plan. So if you've got a situation that you'd like Keith and I to review for you, the process is to gather your policies to include the last annual statement or two and your legal documents, provide a copy of those to Keith, um, the document review takes us approximately seven to ten days. The policy review with a signed form of author authorization by the, um, by the owner of the policy takes anywhere from one to four weeks, depending upon the insurance carrier that's being requested of the information. And then we'll compile that information and come back to you with our findings relative to your objectives and determine whether or not there is um, there's an opportunity to assist you uh, with a, a different, better, or differently positioned product um, and review of your, your life insurance policies. So with that, that's my um, presentation today relative to the importance of review of life insurance. And what we do know is that all clients that choose to take advantage of this sleep a lot better at night knowing that their policies are going to last their lifetimes that they provide them the benefits that are associated with what's available in the marketplace today and that their legal documents direct um, what their financial and personal objectives are um, for their heirs and loved ones. So with that, I will turn it back over to Keith Downey. All right. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that very much. Um, Kim, if you could go to the next slide for me, if you would there. Okay. Uh, we're going to open up for questions here in just for uh, just a minute, but there's my email address so if there's anything that you would like to inquire about uh, without necessarily getting on the mic in front of everybody, uh, feel free to shoot us uh, a question. But I think the uh, the main couple things I'd like for people to take away is the interesting thing in that case study number two that Jeff showed was that was actually an older policy that had done well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a situation where you have an old policy that didn't perform well. Uh, there may be opportunities even in, in uh, a policy that performed well to, to maybe utilize it in a new and different way uh, and leverage it to, to get more benefit or different benefit if you want to add long-term care. Uh, long-term care is another option, is adding them as riders to policies has been attractive to several clients, uh, knowing that the money they put in there, if they don't use it, will get passed along as a death benefit. Uh, seems very attractive. And then just readdressing where you're at, we recently, for one of our clients, uh, uh, had a second-to-die policy that we actually reduced the death benefit on. We had done the policy back in 2006. Their situation had changed dramatically, and we wanted to change the design so that there was not as much being gifted into it each year, and we did not require as much death benefit. But by reviewing that uh, periodically, uh, we determined that, and we actually didn't have to do a create a new policy, we actually just reduce the benefits uh, on the existing one to fit their needs. So um, with that, I will open it up. Kimber, will you open up the mic? If anybody has any questions, you can jump in and Jeff and I will answer them for you. All right. Does anybody have any questions?
All right, Jeff, you must have done a great job. Well, thank you, Keith. Certainly willing to help you all out with um, anything that comes up. Well, I know it's not the most exciting uh, conversation. I know clients, we like, we like to talk about the investments and the fun stuff a lot, but this is certainly a very important piece uh, of the puzzle um, when, when you're doing comprehensive financial planning. So certainly a very important discussion, although maybe not always the most fun thing to talk about, but certainly a necessary uh, piece of the uh, of the puzzle. So uh, with that, uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody for taking time out. Jeff, again, thank you for your time. And um, we look forward to uh, answering any questions you may have. Again, feel free to email us, and have a great day.